You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. For more information, please visit FTSERussell.com, CBOE.com, and CMEgroup.com. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. That music means it is time once again for TWIFO. This week in Futures Options, a program where we break it all down on the Futures Options side of the fence. Maybe we'll talk some metals, some ags, some equities, some FX. You never know. Lean hogs, you never know what's going to make it on the show. That's why you have to tune in each week. My name is Mark Longo from TheOptionsInsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting, at least we tend to think so, Options Insider Network. We might be a little bit biased, but we tend to like it. Seems like a lot of you folks are as well. Every month this year, yet another new record in terms of people coming into the content here. So we love you all. If you like what you hear, keep rating and reviewing. It really does help all the new folks continue to discover the content. We're 15 plus years into this uh, on-demand audio thing, (laughs) and yet new folks continuing to discover it all the time. So if you like what you hear, keep rating and reviewing. And of course, if you want to go above and beyond, you want to join us for exclusive content like pro Q&As on Tuesdays, options oddities every Friday. And of course, get access live to this and everything else we do throughout the week and throw your name in the hat for awesome giveaways like our great Options Insider Pro Trading Crate. Then check out theoptionsinsider.com slash pro. That's the place to go to join us on the dark side there. Let's see who's joining us today on the show. I am pleased to welcome back to CME. And FTSE Russell Hot Seat, our old friend, Mr. Tim McCourt, the Senior Managing Director over there at CME Group, also the Global Head of Equity Products and now FX Products. Tim, welcome back to the show, sir. It has been too long. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Good to be here. And the last time you joined us was way back in April. It's been a while, Tim, when you, <laughs> when you guys rolled out the uh, E-mini S&P Tuesday and Thursday weeklies. So you know what that means. I think you got some cool new products waiting for us in in your hot little hands. But before we get there, sir, before we get there, let's kick off the show the way we always do. It is time for the Movers and Shakers Report. 
It's time to find out what's rallying on the light side and falling to the dark side at CME Group this week. It's time for the Movers and Shakers Report. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Movers and Shakers Report, the portion of the show. We break down everything, lighting it up to the light side, a.k.a. the upside, and to the dark side over there at CME Group this week. If you've been listening to the show for the last couple of months, you know for the last month or so we've had some pretty crazy weeks and pretty wild reports. We could only get maybe a top three or a bottom four because things were moving aggressively in one direction or the other. This week, it's kind of split in the uprights again. It's kind of back to, I won't say normal because nothing's really normal about these markets anymore, but it is back to the reports we know and love where we can make a nice, healthy Top and bottom five, even a top and bottom 10 and beyond, if we were so inclined. All right, Mr. Tim, it's been a while, like I said, since you joined us. So maybe let's let's give you a refresher. We kick off the show <laughs> where we choose the light side and the dark side. So what are you feeling this week, sir, light side or dark side? You know, I'm still a bit optimistic on my return back to the show. So let's go with the light side. You have every reason to be optimistic. You got good stuff percolating <laughs> over there. So let's go light side indeed. Let's keep the optimistic train rolling. And let's start number five to the light side this week, listeners, is platinum up 4.71%. By the way, you want to see this report for yourselves. We tweeted out prior to showtime. CME always tweets it out right before showtime as well. So you can see this report for yourselves if you follow either one of us over there on the old social medias. Platinum number five, 4.71% to the upside. It was number two in the same direction last week, up 8.07%. Again, before you get all excited about talking platinum on the show at not even 400 contracts on the tape, so probably not going to hang out there. Number four, to the ags we go. It is soybeans, up 5.23%. Number three, to energy. A lot of this, <laughs> we're feeling the impact of Ukraine here. Ags and energy. Nat gas, up 5.36%. It was number one in the other direction last week. Up, or I should say off 13.76%. So quite a wild couple of weeks here for a Nat gas. Number two, I was just joking earlier, but they're back in our rundown this week. Listen, as number two, it is lean hogs up 5.99%. Uh, that follows the week when they were number two in the other direction last week, off nearly 10%, about nine and a half percent. So a wild couple of weeks for lean hogs as well. And taking the top spot this week to the light side, it's soybean meal up 6.26%. So Ags and energy with a little bit of metals thrown in there is our upside this week, which is kind of interesting. If we expand it all the way to a top 13, we could get our old friend Bitcoin, which I have a feeling we're going to be talking about a little bit later today. Now to the dark side we go, listeners. Uh, A lot going on to the dark side this week. In fact, if we expand it all the way to a bottom 10, we could squeeze in uh, the E-mini S&P off 1.67% this week. Number nine, the Dow off 1.78%. And all the way at number six, we've got the E-mini NASDAQ off 2.17%. So just outside the bottom five this week, listeners. Number five, one of our old friends, our frequent offenders, it is lumber off 2.42%. It was number four in the other direction last week, up 4.2%. So again, lumber, not a huge options player. It's not going to hang out there. Number four is gold. That certainly does some paper out there, off 2.49%. Number three, it is euro dollars moving to the dark side off 9.39%, followed by heating oil, number two, 9.91%. And number one, the three-month SOFR. You know, we haven't had a chance outside of one one episode, I believe, with Todd Colvin a few months ago to really break down this rise of SOFR. So maybe maybe we'll get into that a little bit later today as well, off 15.07% out there. But Mr. Tim, you come bearing gifts, and I think our audience wants to hear them. So we're going to kick things off in crypto first. It's time to explore the volatile world of Bitcoin, Ether, and more. It's time to talk about crypto. All right, everybody, welcome to the wonderful, the wild world of crypto (laughs) these days. Uh, You guys know where to go if you want to follow along with all these reports for yourselves. See me, group.com slash Twifo. In this case, we're going to go down the asset class. We're going to scroll down one from the top to cryptocurrency where we begin our journey. And Tim, I know you like me. I know you like coming on the show, but you're not just coming on to chat with me. You're coming because you guys had some pretty big announcements this week. What did you guys have up your sleeve over there at CME Crypto this week, sir? You know, very excited. Uh, This week, we introduced uh, options on the larger size Ether futures. So just as a reminder, that's the 50X uh, Ether future ETH that we have here at CME Group. Uh, We introduced options 
uh, on Monday. Very timely, given everything that's been happening this week with the merge of the underlying Ether, uh, Ethereum network. So very excited about that. Clients have been looking forward to the larger size ETH options. Uh, and like I talk about a lot on the show with you, Mark, is you got to listen to the crowd. You got to give them to the, what they want. Uh, so very excited to have this product out there and compliment the rest of the futures and options on futures we have at crypto here at CME. Uh, off to a great start. Saw some you know, great market quality on the screen. Saw some screen trading, some block trading. Uh, so off to a, a, re- a really nice start so far. Well, that's great to hear because it's so new. I don't even have it in my TWIFO report yet. So I can't see the numbers for myself, Tim. So I'm glad to hear that it is it is off to the races. But you mentioned the timing of this. Uh, that was something that was intriguing to me. In fact, our listeners picked up on it as well. We have a listener question along those same lines. This one from JLS. He wants to know, what impact will the Ether merge have on Ether options? Why have them launch on the same week? We have a lot of people asking the same question. Was this part of the plan all along, Tim, or this just a bit of a happy accident? You know, a bit, a bit, uh, fortuitous, right? If I'm being honest, as, as all the listeners know, it takes us a little bit to launch products here at TME, uh, and options require a little bit more work. So we were certainly targeting, right? To have it around the same time. Uh, there's been a lot of chatter about the day, but it did work out a little bit that it all lined up around the same week. So that was exciting. Uh, I think the reason why folks are so curious is when you think about options, generally speaking, when you look at what you can glean from term structure, from the various strikes that are trading, the fact that these the, the larger size Ether options are, you know, we have the six monthly contracts, then we have a few quarterlies, and even uh, we go two Decembers out at a minimum, is you can look at that term structure, structure and really glean those insights about what is the market thinking? What is going to be the price action that we see over the next few weeks and months as people try to figure out and digest what the merge means uh, for, for Ether? And then you hear the, some of the chatter about, you know, when and if uh, transaction fees or gas fees might be impacted. You know, I think the, the general consensus is that we probably won't see that for a few more months into next year. Uh, but because of all that uncertainty and curiosity uh, that the protocol chain might be introducing into the Ethereum ecosystem, options are a great way to try to synthesize from the markets what the markets collectively think might happen and when and what price points people should should care about when looking to manage that risk or access the markets. So I think that's why people are so intrigued in the options is just the informational value they provide that enriches some of the things that we see in futures market structure and term structure. Uh, and then certainly everyone I think on your show loves to trade options. Uh, so kind of, you know, it's certainly topical. But I think they're all so really intrigued by the, the totality of information they might they might be able to get from the curves. Certainly. Uh, I mean, we've been obviously doing the crypto rundown for a while. Every last couple of months, it seems like all the interest, all the action has definitely been in Ether. Of course, leading into this merge, there were some dramatic movements in the underlying, even more so than we saw out there in Bitcoin. Huge swings, a lot of open interest piling into strikes like 3000 and beyond. So a lot of action out there. So I have to imagine... Uh, even if you weren't planning on launching Ether options sometime around now, there had to be a pretty persistent drumbeat, I would think, from a lot of the customers out there, Tim, that they wanted something on the big Ether options front. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I think where it's, it's again, it's, it's something where, as we've talked about on the show before, not only their, their interest in the options and the kind of the increasing of drumbeat around Ether related uh, news and curiosities. You also then look at what we've talked about, where the Ether community from a trading perspective is also distinct. You have some folks out there that almost exclusively trade Ether in their in their cryptocurrency portfolio. They really like it as a trading vehicle and deploying some of their strategies. So I think it's really the confluence of not only what's going on as a function of the technology and the blockchain and the merge occurring, but also just adding that with it's always been an ever increasing enthusiasm, I think, for Ether. Uh, over the last at least, I think, you know, 12 to 18 months from our perspective. Uh, and I, I think it's really those things coupled together have resulted in a, in a lot of interest in the product launch this week. Yeah, it seems like there are almost religious schisms within the crypto space, right? <laughs> if you're super hardcore crypto, you want nothing to do with Bitcoin. You're pretty much all Ether or some of these other smaller Solana, some of these other ones. And you're all in. You're right. They're all in on usually one underlying, whatever that may be. And for a lot of folks, you're right. It is Ether. In fact, I'm looking right now. Like I said, we don't have the the big Ether options percolating yet through the TWIFO reports. Listeners, hopefully by next week's show, they'll be up there. But I can pull up Micro Ether, and those are doing a pretty fair clip. 22,000 contracts on the tape this week. Obviously, crypto selling off, moving in lockstep 
with the big markets right now. So Ether right at about the 1500 level listeners, 1506 right now of that 22,000 contracts, 22%. So a lot of 22s this week going up in the contract that goes out tomorrow. So the Ether micro options trading like an equity, <laughs> all front contract all the time. Let's roll a little bit farther out to see what we can find out here. Uh, by the way, what is the vol in ETH right now? If you've been listening to Crypto Rundown, you know it's flirting with 100 triple digits, and that's pretty much what we're seeing right now. Most of these contracts are at a mid to high 90s level, with the exception of the one going out tomorrow. That's about a 120, but we don't really count that from a vol perspective, listeners. And in terms of action, it was the 1,600 calls. Actually, I take that back. They got just surpassed by the 1,800 calls going out in four days. The 1,800 calls doing 1,627 contracts. All that on Tuesday, a lot of action on Tuesday, 18 halves, 18 hundreds, and 17 halves going up. Not quite a butterfly, but close to the numbers, 1,600 of the 1,800, 700 of the 18 halves, and 530 of the 17 halves. So it could be a weird ratio flyer. Some folks just came to play that day. This is something This is something we've noticed before, Tim, with the micro ether options. I'd be curious to get your thoughts on this as well. We've had some guests come on talking about them, and it does seem like the, the trading out here is... is is staccato like that where we see a ton of paper going up like in this case on this strike on a tuesday and then quiet for a couple of the days have you noticed that as well and what are your thoughts on those kind of interesting trading patterns we're seeing so far in micro ether you know it's certainly been noticing it too and i think what's interesting is is micro ether has also uh, always been successful right out of the gate uh and i think when we look at it in you know almost done with q3 here uh but we're seeing micro ether Options, for example, are you know almost six to seven x the volumes we were seeing in Q2. That's gaining, I think, a, a good amount of momentum on the on the on the option front. But even when you look at the futures, still trading you know twenty twenty five thousand micro ether futures a, a day. Uh, we're only doing about you know ten to fifteen thousand a day compared when we're looking at micro Bitcoin. So ether being a little bit more popular to trade than, than the micro Bitcoin product, and we're really starting to see, to your point, Mark, the micro ether options taking off. Uh, so I think as folks figure out how to trade options on futures on these cryptos, certainly deploying some of some of their strategies. And like and like you said, a little bit of volatility makes it a little bit more exciting for folks. Uh, so not surprised we're seeing a, a maybe a more active Q3 here uh, than we were in Q2. Not quite, I think maybe the the volatility and the the volumes we're seeing from Q1, but certainly ramping up here the last few weeks uh, in September. Yes, intriguing stuff. Definitely a foot listeners here. So a lot of fun stuff. Hopefully you guys have had a chance to uh, dip your toes if you haven't here in some of the micro products. The big one's probably a little bit too big for a lot of our listeners out there. 50 Ether. Not a lot of folks who can swing that outside of the big institutions, but intriguing stuff. Nonetheless, I'll be very interested to see, Tim, if we see similar trading patterns with these bursts of paper in the large Ether options as well. But of course, we're here talking about Ether, but you also have the big BTC and the micro. Anything catching your eye in the world of the big dog that is Bitcoin these days, sir? Yeah, you know, I think it's a good point, right? So even if you if you think about your listeners looking at the micro size contract in terms of a better, you know, more right size product, certainly the introduction of the 50x Ether is going to bring in those institutions. We've seen it not only in micro Bitcoin versus BTC options, but we also kind of even see it in our micro Ethereum uh, products versus their older sibling. Uh, the ES, the NQs, and those those options, where it's still an ecosystem. They settle to the same underlying reference rate. They have slightly different market personalities given the mix of institutions for institution in the in the larger contracts versus the the active individual participation that we see from retail traders in the micro contract. So one will certainly benefit the other. Uh, as we always say, liquidity begets liquidity. Uh, so certainly some of the activity we're seeing in the larger contracts, we do expect to filter down to the micro contract. And same thing with Bitcoin. You know, we're still seeing very good volume uh, out of Bitcoin at CME. And I think that's interesting to note because the price has been a little bit stuck, right, for Bitcoin itself, right? You know, we're, we're hovering around that 20, 21,000 handle, it seems, for a long time. We catch a little bit of a rally and then, you know, the crypto gods take it, take it away again. Uh, now we're right. We're we're below twenty thousand futures today. I think right now we're trading around nineteen thousand seven, nineteen thousand eight hundred. Uh, but despite that kind of you know little bit of sideways price action, we're still seeing strong volumes, which means to me in Bitcoin we're seeing a lot of risk management, a lot of trading strategies. People might be hedging from their physical positions with futures, 
Uh, they might be trading some of the micro futures versus the ETFs that are futures based out there. So we're really seeing that interrelatedness of all the products really start to, to click here in the second half of 2022. And I think that's largely why we're still seeing good volume without necessarily the big price swings that we've seen, you know, maybe previous quarters, even previous years. So still very healthy trading activity and open interest, despite not a ton of price action in Bitcoin uh, in terms of getting those, those big moves back above 20,000. Yeah, it'll be certainly fascinating to see going forward what we see now that we're post ETH merge or about to be, you know, we'll see how that impacts volume out there. Again, Bitcoin, whenever it seems to have strong dalliances below 20,000, we do see some of those uh, certainly big evolutions in the skew. And then we do see some surges in volume. We'll keep an eye on both of these as we're flirting with some interesting levels, 1500 right now in ETH and uh, below 20,000 in Bitcoin again, which are two psychologically important levels to keep an eye on. Speaking of keeping an eye on things, Tim. Back when you joined us in May, you dropped a few little hints, a little breadcrumbs for our crypto fans that you guys are working on. A few other reference rates behind the scenes, just a few, like Algorand, Bitcoin Cash, Cardano, Chainlink, Cosmos, Litecoin, Polkadot, Polygon, Solana. That's a big one. Stellar and Uniswap. Give our listeners an update on how all those are are faring behind the scenes and any interesting developments for our crypto fans, sir. You know, with the additional reference rates, we've gotten really strong, positive responses from the marketplace. And it's a similar story, right, that we heard back in Bitcoin when we, you know, I think it was 2015, right, when we first started our foray into Bitcoin, when we announced the the introduction of the BRR, the Bitcoin reference rate that went live in November of 2016. And that's where these other tokens and coins that are out there the mar- that, you, that you rattled off, the market really wants a clear, trusted once a day statement on what is the value of that coin or token in U.S. dollars. Uh, so that while we don't have tradable products on these new reference rates, they're immensely helpful for people that are looking at structured products that will then the banks across the globe could use to, to onward introduce products for the individual investor. We have some conversations with banks, ETF providers. People are trying to figure out how to use these reference rates to get all sorts of products out there. So we're getting a lot of demand from folks. And if you are trading spot crypto, uh, this is a great way to, to pull up and say this is a definitive source that's a regulated benchmark for what those coins and tokens are worth based on our constituent exchanges. And that's immensely useful for the crowd and the market participants out there. So really pleased with the response that we're getting, uh, you know, with everything, even on the, the index side, like these are great, but what else is out there? There's so many coins and tokens. Uh, so we're constantly looking at what other reference rates we might be introducing, keeping us busy for now. But it's certainly been great to engage with customers on how, the, how they're using the reference rates, the real-time indices that we introduced uh, over the last few months. Uh, so stay, stay, stay tuned on that front. Uh, we'll be looking to, to add to our product of pricing and index portfolio. Uh, but on the tradable product side, you know, Bitcoin and ETH are still most busy. So just important for folks to, to realize these are index-only uh, products that we're talking about, not necessarily tradable products at this time. So if you read between the lines there, listeners, Solana Futures and Options, confirmed by Tim. (laughs) He just did it live here on the show. Run to press, everyone who's listening out there in the media. Confirmed. Solana coming next. No, no. (laughs) Going to get Tim in trouble. I I got to make sure I have plenty of new things to to get back on the show in the future. That's true. They are your excuses to get back on the show. No breaking news today. Breaking news today. Well, let's see if we can find some fun breaking news as we keep on rolling. Tim keeps adding to his purviews over there at CME. So we'll keep rolling through them as we head on into equities next. It's time to explore the volatility swings, skew changes, and hot options trades in your favorite indices. It's time to talk equities. All right, everybody. Welcome to the wonderful, the whipsaw world of equities these days. We are rocking and rolling all over the place. Of course, Saw a very aggressive sell-off earlier this week, the most aggressive single-day sell-off we've seen since the heady days of 2020. And then we are, of course, whipping all over the place again today. We were down, then we were getting back up to unch to even, and now we are back down a full percent across the board, or full percent in the S&P, off over 1% in the in the NASDAQ, and about a third of a percent in the Dow. Of course, all this whipsaw means vol is frothy, if perhaps not quite as frothy, as you might think. And of course, as the sell-off has exacerbated again, these numbers uh, continue to move. It's one of those markets where if you don't like the vol, don't like where the equities are, just wait five minutes and it'll be something different. As we were kicking off the show, we had RBX back north of a 30 handle. RBX, of course, 
the VIX of the Russell 2000, about a 30 and a half, up 1.8 points from last show. So RVX north of 30, that's that's a pretty substantial level. That's a lot of vol out there in small caps, and they have been moving to uh, to generate that. VIX, a little bit shy of the 26 handle, 25 90 or so, up about one and three quarters points when we kicked off the show. That's below even where it even was an hour and change ago over there in the option block. So for all of you out there who've been really looking for this explosion of vol, so far we haven't really seen it. Uh, VVIX, so the vol of vol hanging out at about a 91. It's up about four and three quarters points. Uh, so again, vol of vol, not even getting into the triple digits, a range where we were for the better part of the entirety of the pandemic era until earlier this year. We were north of 100 pretty much from March of 2020 all the way until pretty much March or April of this year. Uh, so these days we're back below it and we haven't really broken above it for quite some time and not again, at least today so far. And vol Q, the at the money vol of the NASDAQ 100, about 3085 or so up about one and a half points from last year. That puts that VIX to RBX. So that large cap to uh, small cap spread at about four and a half points. That's pretty much unchanged from where it was this time last week. And again, we have VIX and RBX moving about the exact same amount. That's what you can expect. And the VIX to vol Q, a little bit shy of a five, about 490. That's still pretty wide, but it's about a quarter of a point tighter than it was this time last week out there. Obviously, Tim, a lot going on <laughs> in the world of equities. When you're not busy launching new Ether options, a lot going on over there in the world of equities, including well, let's start with the products you launched the last time you were on the show, which are, of course, the the daily E-mini uh, S&P Tuesday and Thursday. We had a lot of listeners writing into us saying they're liking having a lot more choice there in the S&Ps. So uh, how have those new products gone since the last time you chatted, sir? They've been great. You know, I mean, they've really been strong out of the gate. Uh, very pleased with the progress that we've seen in that market from a, a volume perspective, from an open interest perspective and a market quality uh, I think what's interesting is when we, you know, when we launched them, probably doing about 150,000 a day of the Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, but a slow ramp of, of volume where in September so far, it's been a pretty, pretty choppy September, uh, to say the least. I'm doing about 300,000 a day so far this month in the Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, and I think it's marked exactly to your point. The listeners out there, the traders, they want the shorter dated stuff. They want that precision of being able to trade every day. I think the Tuesdays and Thursdays are going to be more advantageous as we get into earnings season. You know, in a few weeks again, we've always seen them popular where you can be more precise about what earnings are happening after the bell uh, or any given day. You don't have to kind of overpay, so to speak, for a Wednesday or a Friday option if the event, the earnings releases on a Tuesday. Uh, the other thing that we've talked about uh, is you know, also moving forward with Tuesdays and Thursdays on the NASDAQ. You know, th those are coming just in a few weeks here on October 3rd uh, because folks can't get enough. We have the Mondays and Wednesdays on the Russell now too, right, which are doing a few hundred contracts a day. So it's a theme that we're seeing across all the index options we have. But certainly, you know, E-mini options on the S&P are always kind of the undisputed king over here at CME, uh, having a really strong month, you know, trading almost 1.2, 1.3 mil million contracts a day so far in 2022. And right now, again, about almost 300,000 a day coming from the newly introduced Tuesdays and Thursday, which has been great to see. Let's get into some of those uh, E-mini S&P options, Tim. Coming into showtime, 39.17. The S&P right now off about 150 handles on the week, or about 3.7% now. So uh, looking to keep turning to the dark side, it seems like, today. As is usually the case, by the way, how much paper this week? 3.6 million contracts. So a lot of paper going up. In the E-mini this week, 28% of that, of course, going out in the contract that goes away tomorrow. And, of course, you know what? Most of these big prints are still going to be these uh, aggressive puts. Even though this this week, these puts that the people have been slinging are not as crazy. The biggest prints we're seeing are the 3,900 puts, which makes a little bit more sense given the fact that we are threatening that strike. It's nice to see something that is somewhat relevant going up as opposed to, you know, the 3,300, 3,400 puts, all these things that we see going up. In aggressive strips, we are still seeing that, but at least they're being overshadowed. <laughs> like the uh, behind it, we have the 3370 puts going out to pretty much today have done 41,000 contracts. We're not going to look at those, but instead, the 3900 puts going out uh, tomorrow have been extremely active. Again, as we've had a very active whipsaw week, threatening that 3900 level, then bouncing off of it, then threatening it again. We are threatening again right now as we're speaking. So uh, intriguing stuff out here. And every time we threaten it, 
see more paper out here. The big day for these are actually it's a tie between today and Tuesday, both about 20,900 contracts, followed by Wednesday, 16,200 and Monday, 8,600. Uh, closing the first half of the week and then opening uh, the second half of the week as we've been perhaps uh, re-threatening <laughs> that strike out there. Also seeing a lot of action on the 3,600 strike, seems like across the board. 3,600 puts are are kind of uh, the darling, and not just in the contract that's going away in a few days, but also in contracts a little bit farther out. We're seeing a fair amount of interest here in the 3,600 push. 26,000 of them going up in Dees, for example, listeners. Pretty much active all week long as well. The big day was Tuesday, 11,000, 7,300 on Wednesday, 3,000 on Monday, 5,300 today. Opening all week long. 3,600, of course, right around that level that we kind of bottomed out at last time, listeners. So perhaps there's there's some past his prologue there. Also, 33,000 of the 3,600 puts going up in March of next year, a whopping 180 days to go. And these are pretty much all today, 33,000 of that going up today, pretty much. So that's all today on these 3,600 puts. Looks like it might be a bit of a roll down from the 4,000s to the 3,600s because 15,000 of the 4,000 puts also trading today in March. So close to one by two there. And obviously we don't have the OI number, so we can't tell what is what is opening there. Or it could be just new paper. 4,000 would be a, a very interesting strike given the fact that we are now uh, pretty much <laughs> pretty much below that level. But intriguing stuff nonetheless there. 3,600 puts listeners. That kind of also lines up with what we've been seeing with a lot of our audience polls where you folks, even when we were selling off last time, you liked that that below 3,700 level seemed to be an area where a lot of you were comfortable maybe perhaps starting to nibble. Speaking of starting to nibble in the equities, let's go on out to our old friends, the Russell 2000 out there as well. See what's lighting it up. We have been seeing a lot of paper out there in uh, in small cap related names like IWM. Looks like Rutt doing a little bit lighter paper today, only about 13,000 contracts on the week. Usually we'll see 25,000 easy on a pretty active week. It has been a pretty active week out there from an underlying perspective. 52 points to the dark side on the week for uh, Russell 2000, 1830 as we're kicking off this segment. So still pretty far from the 2000 level we were at not too long ago out there in the Russell 2000 listeners. In terms of the paper, the lion's share of it going up in the contract that goes out tomorrow. Looks like it's the 1810 puts. We're at 1830. We're going to move a little bit farther out see if we can find some other paper to uh, to sink our teeth into out here. It looks like all sorts of 19 half calls in September. 15 days to go are pretty active out here as well. That's an interesting strike given the fact that they're about 113 handles out of the money. So we'll hang out out there, listeners. The vol as you go out a couple of weeks to September is almost a 30, 2972. So that's pretty close to what we were talking about with RVX. That was a little bit north of 30. This is pretty close to a 30 as well. So Vol is pretty frothy in the small caps, as you might imagine, given how much action we're seeing out there. It's up about four points this week here, so intriguing stuff. In terms of skew, last week the puts, 9% bid this week, 10.5% bid. The calls last week, 7.6% cheap. The calls this week, 9% cheap, and a lot of that 19 half calls. So maybe some folks trying to overwrite. Let's see when these went up. These went up pretty much throughout the week, mostly Monday and Tuesday. Uh, Opening on Monday, closing on Tuesday. So they could have just uh, had a one-day trade out there. Either way. We are seeing that call wing uh, come in a little bit. Tim, outside of the daily expirations in the S&P, obviously we're seeing a lot of action out there across the the broad array of products you guys have out there in the in the equity space. Anything else catching your eye and lighting up your tape out there these days, sir? Yeah, I think Russell has always been something that, that we'd love to talk about. I'm always glad to see uh, that folks are continuing to trade and deploy option trading strategies in, in, in the Russell you know, also one of the things that we, we've talked about a few times and it continues to be the trend is how the NASDAQ is doing. We're seeing increased option trading uh, in the NASDAQ complex at CME. They're always off to, to kind of the, the races here in, in 2022. Glad to see that those are continuing uh, to be of interest to the participants. And I think it really goes to what we've spoken to a few times. The tr- you know, I think we started really saying this in, in late in 2020 certainly all of last year and continuing here into the end of the Q3 of 2022 is that is index choice matters. As these various indices, the underlying price movements are becoming more and more divergent. They're not necessarily behaving the same way given their, the, you know, the, the mega cap concentration of, of the NASDAQ, 
the broad base concentration of, uh, or the broad base index constitution of the S and P 500 and the small cap focus of the Russell. These are all things that are going to lead to very fundamental different uh, price movements and price discovery when some of these these news cycles are happening yesterday. Even though it was it was kind of a nowhere to hide yesterday, so to speak, in some of these markets, and it's been a tough week for sure. But they're still trading slightly differently in terms of percent moves and how they're how they're handling some of the news being uh, digested in the market. So I would say trading options across all the indices is one of the things that are a great way uh, for folks to, to get involved in the markets. And now that we have e-mini options, micro e-mini options on the S&P and NASDAQ, lots of product choice here at CV. I just really encourage folks to, to get involved. Uh, and when the markets are moving, it's always an opportunity uh, to deploy new trading strategies or Great, great reminder that it's important to hedge, and options are always a great tool for that for market participants as well. All right, Tim, you twisted my arm. We'll talk NASDAQ as well. You know, you <laughs> twist my arm. I guess we could squeeze that onto the show as well. Go to that same equities drop down list, and there's pop up from the Russell. Go right in the middle between the S&P and the Russell. You see the NASDAQ 100. A little bit shy of 12,000 right now, 11,946 off about, oh, a whopping 646. Hey, I love the movements in the NASDAQ. They're always well, are eye-catching off 5.13% just since Monday's session. In terms of vol, by the way, before we even get there, how much paper going up in the uh, NASDAQ options this week? 141,000 contracts, nothing to sneeze at. Of course, 46% of that is going away tomorrow. <laughs> I'd love the equities. If it goes beyond a day, they want nothing to do with it. Uh, let's see. We'll go a little bit farther out, listeners, because it is kind of hard to parse, even though it's like, it looks like it was the 12,000 puts that were leading the dance out there, which, again, makes sense. Very important psychological level. We were flirting with it, bouncing off of it, breaking through it. So it does make sense that pretty much 12,000 puts are kind of the order of the day out here, listeners. We got 5,000 going up that expire tomorrow. We got their trading here in the SEP contract that goes away in eight days. We have them going up in another SEP contract that goes away in four days. Uh, so 12,000 puts are definitely definitely leading the dance out here this week. Let's go a little bit farther out to a month that has a little bit more meat on the bone here. Let's go, let's go all the way out to the, uh, the week three October. <laughs> has a whopping 36 days to go. Uh, the that did a fair amount of the paper out here this week as well. And the vol out there, you may be wondering, what is it? It's it's you know, it's going to be high. It's a 30 and a half out there right now, listeners in that contract. So up about three, almost about 3.1 points on the week. Uh, skew wise, the puts last week, 11.9 percent bid this week, 13.8. So the puts catching a little bit of a bid. Not surprising once you break through those psychological levels. That tends to happen. The calls 9.7 percent cheap this week, 10.9 percent cheap. So the calls coming in. Puts getting bid, not exactly uh, crazy surprising. Also seeing, before we even get into some paper, we also seeing the 12,400 puts in December trading pretty actively. About 2,000 of those going up this week as well. So that's an interesting strike. Looks like all of that was trading on Wednesday. We had, looks like a pretty, actually, no, they were both opening. So there was the 12,800, 12,400 vertical. Went up about 1,600 times on Wednesday, opening on both legs. So. Those are interesting strikes to be opening on there. That future is still 12,000 and about 20, but those are still either way, no matter how you parse it, those that's a deeply in the money put spread and kind of a strange choice, but we have been seeing a lot of strange paper out here this week, but the 12,000 puts are definitely where the action was out here in the NASDAQ this week. All right, Tim, I will give you the choice of where we want to hang out next. We have a lot of movers and shakers lighting up this week, or we can also a take a segue. The fact that you're on the show gives us a good excuse to maybe talk one of your newer purviews of FX. What do you think, sir? Where should we head out next? Yeah, let's talk a little bit about FX. The dollar, the euro, the yen, and more. It's time to explore what's happening in major currency options around the world. It's time to talk FX. You know, as I've always said, I love all my equity index children, you know, in terms of all their involvement. <laughs> now the, the family keeps on growing here. We got FX. Uh, you know, I now I'm the global head of FX as well here uh, at CME Group starting back in, in February. And appropriate because yesterday, Mark, I don't know if you saw, if you were aware of this. Yesterday was a record trading volume for FX where we traded a little over 3 million contracts yesterday. First time FX futures and options at CME also broke the 3 million handle. 
And FX options doing really well as well. Traded almost 50,000 FX options yesterday uh, with the euro USD options and yen dollar options leading the way, trading about 30,000 and 10,000 respectively. So I think people are getting excited about FX FX again these days. Uh, lots of macro drop uh, backdrop happening. You know, we have the pound and the and the euro, you know, kind of trading very close to the dollar for the first time in a long time. Uh, so lots of volatility in the markets, and you know, FX is I think it's starting to come back around, getting people excited. Well, first off. You don't need two business cards if you keep adding all these different uh, <laughs> domains to your purview over there. So now you got FX in there as well. And I've also said you had good timing when you add new products because you you take over FX right as right as the dollar breaks parity <laughs> with the euro for the first time in over a decade. So good timing there as well because we do this show obviously every week and I can count on probably one hand outside of the last month or two. I can count on one hand probably over the last year the number of times. We've had occasion to really mention FX on the show because there just wasn't a lot going on out there from a vol or a volume or a skew perspective. And now with the dollar on the rampage, Tim, all of a sudden FX making it into our show every week. So once again, I have to say good timing to you, sir. You, you picked up <laughs> FX at a good time. Absolutely. Sometimes, it's, uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's helpful to also be uh, lucky and good. You know, it's a little bit of luck for sure. I wish I could take single-handed credit for the explosion of FX Vol. Uh, but, you know, causation, correlation, tomato, tomato, uh, I'll take it, right? You'll so, take it. However, however it comes exactly. your way, you will take it. So let's see what we're taking out here in terms of uh, Euro USD. Obviously, the big dog out here in FX land listeners and also the one that's captioning all the headlines. Where are we hanging out from a parity level? We're pretty much at parity right now we're actually at 1.006 so right about as close as you can be uh, to that parity level pretty darn close to it listeners so yet again discount times head to europe sales <laughs> over there right now in terms of paper 138,000 contracts on the tape right now so a pretty robust week here for the euro usd and unlike an equity it's not all going out tomorrow actually nearly 60 percent of that paper is going up in let's see where are we we're in the we're in the D's contract actually that expires in 84 days that's refreshing <laughs> a little bit longer term paper it's so nice to talk about paper that doesn't go out tomorrow that's very exciting uh, and let's see of that yeah wow of that 138,000 61,000 contract we'll get to exactly what it was but just in this one print wow that's a that's a lot of paper <laughs> Uh, so, yes, this set contract, what is the volume? You might be wondering out here again, FX, kind of like the rates, not always known for being a bastion of high volatility, but ticking up a little bit out here. It's a 10 and a half this week, up about four tenths of a point. So closing on half a point, which for starting from a low basis point, obviously, but half a point, nothing to sneeze at out here in in the old FX complex. In terms of skew, let's see, it looks kind of like an equity out here that put 7.7% bid last week, this week, 9.7% bid. So the Puts ticking up a bit. The call's 4.8% cheap last week. This week, 5.8% cheap. So call's getting cheaper. Puts getting bid. Looks like an equity. But the paper is not like an equity because I mentioned 138,000 contracts listeners. 61,796 of that came in one print today on these 1.07 calls in September. That is enormous. That's, they trade, that's pretty much it for the week. That, that was their one big print. So almost half of the paper went up out here in this one print and calls today, 1.07. Wow. So to say these uh, these FX contracts are starting to come to life in the latter portion of the week, that would certainly be an understatement here. I'm trying to see anything else even comes close to this. This is an enormous print. Uh, beside this, the next largest print is 8,300 of the 1.03 calls. Also, it's still in that same September month, but they went up on Wednesday mostly, so that wasn't even related to today's paper. So an enormous print. You don't usually see half of your volume listeners going up in one print, but that's what we're seeing out here. That also explains why the numbers are so strong out here in good old Euro USD as well. We had a lot of ags lighting it up out here this week as well. So let's take a quick detour out into the ags. Next listeners. It's time to get our hands dirty exploring the latest options, trades, and trends in corn, wheat, soybeans, and more. It's time to talk ags. All right, everybody. Welcome to the wonderful world of ags. Drop out of that uh, FX drop down, listeners, and pop up all the way to the top of the list 
to get to ags. We're going to go over the grains and oil seeds. Usually we'll hang out in wheat or corn. Today we're going to go into the beans because the beans are lighting up our tape this week, listeners. Soybean meal number one and soybeans number four. Of course, soybeans, the more active of the two and pretty active this week. 275,000 contracts on the tape this week, listeners. So soybeans, nothing to sneeze at out there today. And of that, 53% going up in the contract that expires in November. Yeah, so not a bad little clip out here. Again, not going out tomorrow, so we like that out here. Soybeans right now, 1451 on that front future. And the vol out here, about 2430. It's up about a half a point on the week. Not a huge vol move this week. A skew also looks like those skew numbers kind of staying relatively similar to what they were last week, which was kind of flat. Last week, the puts were two-tenths of a percent, I should say. But cheap this week, they're half a percent cheap. So pretty much flat. The calls last week, 2.4% bid. This week, 1.9%. So what you have is a pretty flat skew curve. Listen, not a huge bid in either direction, which again, kind of shows you this market is kind of shrugging its shoulders. It doesn't know where this product is going to go next. So we're not seeing any huge bias in one direction or the other. I guess I if you go all the way out to... If you go all the way out to July of next year, and actually this is August of next year, uh, you have a huge discount to the puts there. They're about 19% cheap. This week, that's mostly gone. So that could have been a, a weird blip in the paper out there. But outside of that, we're seeing pretty much flat skews across the board, which is kind of interesting and also surprising and refreshing given the fact what we're seeing all these other products like equities and even FX where the skews are very pronounced in one direction or the other. In terms of action this week, like I said, we're at a 1451 in soybeans. It was the 1600 calls doing 14,000 contracts. Uh, the big day was Monday for those 10,000 on Monday, uh, 1700 today, 1500 on Monday, and about a thousand, a little less than a thousand on Wednesday. Opening throughout the week, so a lot of opening action on the 1600s, which again, a decently out of the money call strike, but nonetheless a popular one this week. A uh, 1400 puts, that's a little closer to the fire. They're doing about 13,000 contracts. Uh, they were right behind it there. They were pretty active all week long. The big day was Tuesday, about 5,000 contracts on Tuesday, 4,200 on Monday, 1,700 Wednesday, and about 2,000, 2,100 actually today. Back and forth opening to closing on that strike. It makes sense. We're kind of flirting with it, so it makes sense. We'd see some opening and closing paper on those. We also saw interest in the 1,500 calls, a little bit closer than the 1,600s. 11,300 of those trading this week. Again, the big day was Monday, 6,200. Most of that seemed like that was closing as well as 2,600 on Tuesday and about 1,000 each Wednesday and today, opening in the latter portions of the week. So interesting action. Let's go a little bit farther out, see what else we can find. 1,300 puts here in January of next year. Did about 7,500 contracts this week, so a lot of action in those as well. 14 half puts going out in about a week, also pretty active, doing about 5,000 contracts this week. If we go a little farther out, we don't see, unlike gold and some of the metals, we don't see a ton of out of the money paper with the exception of the 1700 calls. Those are pretty active in March of next year, doing about 3000 contracts and in April of next year, doing about a thousand as well. So intriguing stuff out there. Let's see, we are a little bit more time. So let's try to squeeze in a real quick pit stop into energy before we get some of your listeners on the show next. It's time to tap into the deep options well of black gold, Texas tea, nat gas, and more. It's time to talk energy. All right, everybody. Welcome to the world of energy. Get on out of that drop down in the ags. Scroll on down two slots to energy. We're going to click on over into uh, nat gas today. That's where we're going to hang our hat. Obviously, one of our Big movers and shakers, number three to the light side this week, but pretty much every week, Nat Gas is moving and shaking. 823 is where it's hanging out right now, so up about 24 cents on the week, or about 3%, of course, up over 5% from where it was on last week's show. And again, about actually light paper out there this week. Usually this time of week, we're going to see 400 plus thousand contracts on the tape this week, about 275,000, so surprisingly light. Before Nat Gas this week, I think some folks' attention is diverted elsewhere to equities and other complexes that have been really whipsawing around a lot this week. Still, of that paper, about 40% going up in the contract that goes away in about 12 days. That's interesting for Nat Gas. We don't always see 
it trading like an equity like that, where it's all kind of front contract all the time. But that's what we're seeing today. It's right around our cutoff point, listeners. So we'll make a exception for that because it is interesting paper here in the Nat Gas. By the way, what is the vol in Nat Gas right now? It's at about a 75 in that front contract. But if you go out a couple of weeks, it gets up into the 90s pretty quickly. So the vol gets pretty frothy. We get out to next year, it's over triple digits, 105. So that vol ramps up pretty quickly out there. In terms of skew in that front contract, the puts last week, 1.8% cheap this week, 1.2% bid. So not a lot of action on the puts. The calls, 3.9% bid last week, this week, 2.3%. So they're coming in a little bit. Kind of a, a flat skew, again, which is interesting, given the fact that that's not what we normally see in Nat gas. In fact, you go out to, let's say, March of next year, you've got a 10% discount on the puts and a 15% bid in the calls. So very pronounced skew out there, whereas the contract going out in about a week, or actually close to two weeks, kind of flat, which is kind of interesting. In terms of the action out here, it was the 10 calls, the 10 even calls leading the dance out here this week. In fact, the 10 calls looks like they were lighting it up across the term structure. A lot of months trading 10 calls, but the most active were in the contract going out in about 12 days. They did 13,500 contracts this week. The big day was Wednesday, a little over 6,000 on Wednesday. Almost 5,000 going up today. The rest scattered throughout the early part of the week. They were closing the first couple of sessions. Wednesday was the big day, and that was mostly opening. So, again, that 10 strike has been on our radar, obviously, for quite some time. We flirted with it. We've broken through it. We've come back down. Uh, folks, obviously, uh, piling in to that strike again today on both sides because we didn't see a huge amount of evolution in the skew. So a lot of back-and-forth trading on those 10 calls. Also saw action on the 12 calls. So if 10 is not rich enough for your blood, 12 calls in two weeks. That would be interesting. About 8,000 of those, listeners, the big day again was Wednesday. Those were mostly closing, so it could have been a bit of a roll from the 12s down to the 10s because they all traded on Wednesday and mostly closing on the 12s, mostly opening on the 10s. So could be a bit of a roll down, which would make some sense, even though that's still a long way to go over the next, oh, 12 days. But again, we've seen that gas do crazier things. Also action on the seven puts 7,500 of those this week, uh, the big day for those. Actually, today, 3,800 today, 2,000 on Monday. The rest kind of scattered throughout the week and, and opening, closing throughout the week as well. We're also still seeing that that three-put time strip continues to trade. Looks like the number is lower this week. It's been around 2,400 or so. In recent shows this week, it's 1,100. <laughs> That's still the number. But it is trading yet again throughout all the months of next year, pretty much from March all the way to September and perhaps even beyond. So intriguing stuff afoot out here in Nat Gas. You know what's always intriguing, listeners? It's your questions and your comments and your votes in our polls. So let's get to it now. A little bit of your futures options feedback. It's time for your questions, comments, and insights. It's time for futures options feedback. Submit your questions at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider stocktwits.com slash options insider or via questions at the options you can also submit your feedback via our options insider radio network mobile app available for ios android and kindle fire devices you can even ask your questions live via our mixler chat room so grab the mixler app or just search for options insider at mixler.com that's M-I-X-L-R dot com. All right, everyone. Welcome to the Futures Options Feedback segment. Uh, Tim, I want to get your thoughts on some of these questions. We already answered this one from JLS about uh, the impact of uh, the Ether merge here on your timing. Obviously, it sounded like that was just opportune timing, even though it sounds like it worked out uh, pretty interestingly. I also want to get your thoughts, Tim. On our question of the week, we have an interesting question of the week this week. We asked you folks, you know, we've seen an explosion of new options traders in recent years. So that brings us back to the age old question. When did you start trading options? And we ran this poll about eight months ago or so, 10 months ago, and we got some pretty surprising results. So we wanted to revisit it this week. Uh, Tim, we gave them four choices. We said you just started this year. So complete 2022 options newcomer. Or you started in the kind of pandemic rush years of 2020 and 2021. Or you started in that period after the, the great financial crisis, so 2009 to 2019. Or you 
predate that. So in terms of our pool, you're quote unquote old school, even though I would say if you started in 2009, you're not exactly old school, but still uh, intriguing stuff. Obviously, we, we didn't have room for a super old school, Tim. So no, 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 <laughs> no room for that on our poll. But I'm curious, what do you think our audience is voting for in terms of when did they start trading options? You know, that, oh, it's a tough one. I feel like more and more people are certainly getting involved, especially during the kind of work from home era. But I feel like you might get, I got to go old school. I feel like, I don't know. Old Go school. Old school. Old school. I could see that. Uh, and old school is number two, Tim. I'll give you that. All right. <laughs> old All school. Right. So you're coming close here. Actually, the winner right now is the crazy decade post great financial crisis. So the 2009 to 2019, 45.9%, followed by old school number two, almost 30%, 29.7%. So you add those in, around 75% of our audience are pre. 2019 at the very least, which is nice. <laughs> a lot of them. 20, old, pre- old, old school enough. Old yes, school old enough. school. And these days it is because we, we ran yeah. this poll last time. A full third of the audience had started trading within the last three to six months, which is why we pulled out just started this year as its own vote. And so far, it's only getting 2.7% of the vote. That kind of surprises me. Maybe people are embarrassed to admit that. I don't know. But 21.6% yeah. say they joined. I started trading options in 2020 or 2021. So Close to 25% of the audience has started in the last couple of years, which kind of is in keeping with what we've been seeing out there. The huge influx of new uh, people out there. It's like we got one more here, Tim, for you, if you can handle it before we go. We got a question coming in here from, where did it go? I just had it. There we go. From uh, TTT, Tim. He wants to know, he says, does CME ever worry that their trading calendar doesn't line up with the weekend trading cycle for Ether and Bitcoin? You know, we've had this question a few times on our crypto show as well. Obviously, Tim, ETH and crypto, they trade kind of 24-7. Uh, the CME products trade on the traditional trading cycle. Uh, for me, we were just joking on our on our boot camp show yesterday. It is a, nice to have a bit of a respite sometimes out there. But I'm sure you get this feedback from some hardcore crypto heads all the time. What do you have to say for those folks who say, hey, I, I don't get the you know the weekend in this? Yeah, it's a great question. It's something we've, we've heard ever since we introduced Bitcoin futures back in 2017. You know, there's a lot of chatter out there on crypto Twitter about the CME gap. Uh, it's something that we hear. We understand it. Uh, it's just something that we, we need to continue to work on and engage with customers. It's not, it's not the easiest thing for us to, to move the entirety of our current model over the weekend. Uh, keeping in mind that our crypto products trade on Globex with all of our other products and we do need that weekend maintenance for upgrades for improvement to actually introduce our new products that we're always rolling out and talking about our on your show. So we do need that weekend downtime. We are working on it. It is something we're trying to work with our tech team and our clearing house and our clearing members and market makers. And the conversation we're having, no plans yet, but I hear you. I get it. It's a great question. And uh, it's just one of the things that we're still working through a few years into the the advent of crypto derivatives is that it's one of the it's I think the market that's a little bit different where the underlying spot market is open more than the derivatives market. And it's something we're working on. So to keep, so keep the feedback coming, the more demand I have, the easier I can pound the table internally here and convince people this is the direction we should be working on. Uh, but kind of all, all joking aside, keep, keep, keep the comments coming because we, we want that feedback from, from listeners. Uh, we are working on it, but it is, a, it is a, a challenge for us to solve right now. It's interesting, Tim, because all these crypto folks, this is their first trading product, right? So they have no experience with anything that has a normal trading cycle. To them, this is normal, right? Well, you're not 24-7? That's crazy. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's right. that's, that's yeah. just normal to them. Unfortunately, Tim, that music means we come to the end of another episode. Of How'd it go? Did you have fun on the show today? Fun as always. Thanks for having me on. Well, before we go, Mr. Tim, you always like to leave our audience wanting more, so... If you want to leave them with any hints, any teases of what they can look forward to from you and either the equities or FX or crypto teams over there at CME, now is the time, sir. The floor is yours. Yeah, no, no, no hints or teasers. You know, I, I want to make sure I, I keep lots of stuff, lots of arrows in my quiver to make sure I am a, a recurring guest on the show, Mark. But I will encourage people to go to cmegroup.com, not only to revisit any of the things we talked about today or on previous shows, but that's a great place to go and sign up for updates. Uh, just in case I don't make it back on the show, they want to stay up to date on the latest and greatest stuff we have on product rollouts and other product news here at CME. Just go sign up for all those updates at cmegroup.com. 
Uh, and I just encourage people to, to stay informed and keep on trading and keep the questions coming into your show. I always love being on here and looking forward to being back. There we go. You know where to go to learn more about all these products, listeners. You start, of course, at seemegroup.com slash TWIFO. That's where you get the reports for the show. Then you can branch out into all the different product categories that Tim's talking about here. Of course, the education or the research from Blue and Eric. A lot of great stuff. Uh, once you start heading over there, you're going to spend some time. Be warned, but it's time well spent. Seemegroup.com slash TWIFO is the place to begin that journey. And, of course, you know where to go to learn more about all things small caps. So, how is recon shaping up the markets? What's going on from a vol perspective? How is COVID impacting small caps and a whole bunch more? It's FTSERussell.com, FTSERussell.com. Give them a follow on the old Twitters while you're at it, at FTSERussell, all one word. That's going to do it for us on the network today. Listeners, don't worry. Back again tomorrow. Episode 501. How do we follow up the big 500th episode spectacular volatility views? Got to tune in tomorrow to find out. Should be fun. Noon Central, 1 p.m. Eastern for that. And then after that, for all you folks in the pro camp, exclusively options oddities coming at you right after ball views tomorrow. Then back again next week, all the way through to another Thursday, another episode of This Week in Futures Options. Stay safe out there, everybody. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. Investors in the U.S. and around the world are using FTSE Russell indexes to benchmark their investment performance and create investment funds, ETFs, structured products, and index-based derivatives. Many Options Insider Radio Network listeners will be familiar with the Russell 2000 Index. Russell 2000 Futures and Options are currently trading on the Chicago Board Options Exchange and CME Group. For more information, please visit FTSERussell.com, CBOE.com, and CMEGroup.com. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs>